and and above all, you know, if you care about your children, you know, work towards push, pulling back from this business as usual. Because uh, if we continue to apply this level of forcing, we're going to see certainly some nasty, nasty surprises out there. And there's a few other in the queue, too, that I should probably talk about. Okay. Can you be sure? I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This time around, we're speaking with documentary filmmaker and world-class science communicator Peter Sinclair. Peter walks the fine line between knocking down climate deniers and setting straight the doom and gloomers of the world. Join me in welcoming Peter Sinclair. Get us going. Um, <laughs> and before, before the official startup or anything, I, I'm happy to, you know, if you have any questions about who I am or what I and we are doing, I'm happy to ask, answer that. But um, so I'm I'm Dean Walker, and I um, uh, up until yeah, about ten years ago, I uh, the vast majority of my work was doing training with. Uh, corporate groups or uh, training adults to work with at-risk teens in, in community programs and uh, also working with couples and, you know, intimacy work. So a lot of different kinds of training. And I've always been a, a fairly environmental, environmentally aware and uh, concerned person. But it was about five years ago that I... Um, got exposed to some uh, some data that really just blew my doors off that I thought either this is the craziest wacko BS I have ever heard, or this is truly the transformation of humanity, whether we want it or not, whether we're ready for it or not. And uh, <clears throat> I proceeded to learn how to learn about the basics of of climate change and a number of other uh, metrics for collapse of systems, both human and earth systems. And um, needless to say, I vetted that, you know, um, quite a bit of the, the material that first shocked me. And um, your videos time and time and time again were uh, representing voices that I deeply respected. And I, I keep track of who's producing the videos because that's a part of what I do. I, I really enjoy it. I'm nowhere near as good as you are, but I, I love it. I, um, quality makes a big difference to me. Uh, integrity of the message makes a huge difference to me. And I can, I can just feel that uh, consistently in everything that I've uh, experienced from you. So um, in a roundabout way, I'd like to offer my thanks to, you know, your, your, your productivity for, I've, I, I'm, I, I can't wait to find out how long you've been doing it and, you know, a number of other things about your, your track record. Um, and to, to finish off the introduction, I, um, as a part of this process in this past five years, I, I knew that very few other people would do this kind of homework, would really vet the material and, and then actually be motivated to action about it. So I wrote a book about that. I wrote a book in which I shared my conclusions and I begged people not to accept my conclusions, to, to do it for themselves. And then it kind of gave them some shortcuts to uh, vetted uh, sites where vetted material can be found more readily and so on. And uh, as you can imagine, this is kind of the third rail of all conversations. So, you know, um, all 12 of the books that I've sold, I'm, I'm not sure 
how many people have, uh, <laughs> have done the vetting. Um, and lastly, I, uh, I've been working with a woman named Carolyn Baker. I don't know if her name rings a bell for you at all, but uh, she um, is probably the most prolific author that I'm aware of that addresses the question, what are the qualities of our life, qualities of relationship in particular, uh, as we look into a predicament-laden world? You know, when we've got these massive challenges uh, in both uh, the, the imminent challenge and, and possible collapse of many different Earth and human systems, she's really been addressing how do we stay related? How do we keep our hearts open? How do we keep ourselves well in, in, inside uh, while these things are, are confronting us each day? And so it's been a real pleasure to work with Carolyn. Um, and it's our intention to provide, you know, workshops, coaching, resources, whatever people need to be better equipped uh, to, to face a predicament-laden world. Um, and, um, you know, what I can say with some some pride is that we are not, we're really not aiming ourselves toward saving anything. Uh, I don't know, I'm looking forward to finding out what your orientation is and so on, but we're, we're really um, fairly clear that there are so many uh, easier possible off ramps that we could have taken that we've obviously just blown by that um, our work it really aims at, at having people be as present as possible, as heartful with one another as possible, um, and to hopefully disengage some of the drivenness that has gotten us to this, to this brink. Um, so that's the nature of our work. And that's, if there's anything I've left out, anything you'd like to know, I'm happy to respond. Well, uh, are, are we are, are we into the formal uh, podcast yet, or what? No, where, I mean, I, I, I can always excerpt from it if there's some way that we refer back to it or something. It's it's easy to do, but I hadn't really started yet. I just wanted you to know who is this guy and why does he want to talk? Sure, to <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, well, I think some of the questions. <coughs> Uh, I would probably make sense to be in the podcast because I want to ask what the information was that really kind of got you uh, going on this. Um, and, and also, you know, I made a little note here while you were talking uh, about, you know, people doing their, their own research, which is commendable, but also fraught, you know, <laughs> on, on the internet, as we know. And, uh, and, you know, my own approach has been, I talk to people who are PhD scientists with 10, 20, 30 years working and publishing in the field, respected by their peers. And I ask them to teach me. And, and then my job is to kind of translate what they're saying without you know, qualifying it or distorting it or, or, you know, cherry picking it or anything. And, and the best evidence that I've been able to do that is that they still keep returning my calls and, and more and more they, they invite me, you know, to their events and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, uh, my, my, uh, my, work is designed to provide resources that are like, you know, here's what the scientists are saying, you know, uh, rather than uh, you, there's, there's so many uh, off, off ramps on the internet that will take you into to really questionable territory. And it's, uh, it's very tough. And, and that's one of the big problems that we have right now is, 
yeah. uh, all these people who are doing their own research on the internet. And uh, boy, it's, it's once people get on a track, it's pretty hard to, to shake them out of it. Right. Um, well, Peter, let me stop you there for just a moment and do the official sure. uh, opening and welcome because I think I'm just going to leave it all in place. You've already said uh, enough that I'd like to leave that in and so on. So um, uh, a bit belatedly, uh, those of you who are viewing this uh, Poetry of Predicament podcast, and I, you know, are we on June 4th? Is that, does that sound right? Fifth. Fifth. <laughs> Fifth. We're on June 5th, 2018, and I'm just uh, really thrilled to be just meeting and starting a conversation with Peter Sinclair. Peter Sinclair has been, um, uh, a, I imagine, a long-time video producer. We're going to find out his history. Um, he's been instrumental in me being able to find um, what I call the vetted material, or sometimes I call it the sober data of our world. And um, as as you saw in the first part of this um, this video, uh, he was letting us know what a challenge that is to be able to maintain some level of quality, some level of integrity uh, when translating it or relaying it from the experts in the field and making it accessible to the rest of us. And so, um, you know, I've already thanked you once, but really it, it'll come a few more times. <clears throat> it really has meant a, a tremendous amount because it's... Uh, uh, especially three or four years ago, um, it was even worse it, it, for me. It was just hard to find. It was not an easy thing. It was either um, these robust, thick, um, actual you know findings from research, uh, from studies uh, that you know maybe I got a bit of the summary, but I I didn't know where to go with it, and then. Uh, what I'd also, I know we'll get to, because I can hear it in what you've already said, um, to, you know, you've spent quite a bit of time also talking with these scientists about, excuse me, how they communicate. You know, they're, they've been notoriously not so good at it, but in their own words. And so I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what your experience of that evolution has been, because you've been right there. You've been literally recording them in extraordinary ways, like short videos that really get right to the point, very human and easy to understand language. So, uh, Peter, thank you so much for enduring a way too long introduction. Welcome here. And um, where would you like to start? Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh... Where would I like to start? Um, well, you 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 asked a little bit about my background, and we don't have enough time to go through that my checkered career. But uh, uh, briefly, um, I, I grew up in a family that was involved in some fairly contentious environmental issues here in Michigan that were uh, eventually got some national attention. Um, my my uh, mother was asking questions about a, a big nuclear plant that was being cited within the city limits of our town. Uh, pardon me. I get a lot of these calls. Um, and uh, so as a teenager, I uh, was sort of uh, gathering a whole lot of, of experience and information about the economics of energy and the hey, uh, I'm, able to make it to the I'm sorry I don't even know how to turn that off anyway um, so as a teenager I was just uh, uh, inhaling a whole lot of really powerful examples and information about the economics of energy, the economics of corporate power, and the dynamics of uh, how how things were working at a pretty high level, uh, and I followed that. Uh, I have followed that uh, throughout my life uh, you know, through the media and uh, uh, starting from kind of a knowledgeable base, but then you know uh, building on that as I went and. Uh, 
uh, started getting concerned about climate change really in the 70s. There were people writing about it uh, that you could, you could see it was a problem coming on the horizon. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, Carter administration talked about it and then their uh, 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 Environment 2000 uh, publication that came out in, I think, 70 seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 80s, you started getting research from uh, uh, Jim Hansen and others uh, that I was following and growing increasingly concerned. And uh, the, uh, uh, in 1988, uh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago this month, uh, Hansen testified to Congress and, and basically laid it out, said we now are detecting the signal of the predicted global warming. It is here. And um, that was uh, a watershed moment for me. And I was, uh, I had kind of tried in my career path to like get away from all the activism and and all the, the, the battling back and forth uh, type stuff, and I I had uh, I had a background in graphic arts. Uh, at that point, I launched a cartoon strip that was based on environmental uh, concerns, more or less, and uh, that actually ran in in six countries for a brief time. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, newspaper editors weren't quite getting it. Um, so that, uh, uh, that was kind of a, a, a bit of a pratfall, but, uh, long story short, the internet came along. Uh, I got involved in that. I started doing, uh, uh, more electronic media, more web design, and eventually more animation and, not so much video on my own, but contributing to other people's uh, productions. And it finally reached a point um, uh, around the time, well, when I saw uh, uh, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, I, you know, at that point, I, I had been pretty frustrated for quite a while about what we were doing about climate change. And very shortly after I learned that uh, Al Gore was training people to more or less understand the message a little bit better. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to get invited down to Nashville as part of uh, one of his first groups. And that's where I met my first uh, real high level climate scientists. And those uh, folks became my teachers and uh, you know, started with one or two and pretty soon it was 10 and now it's hundreds. And, uh, you know, many of them, are, you know, not only my teachers, but they're my friends now. And um, they, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that they've come to trust me in, in terms of carrying the message that they are trying to convey. And there's been a general understanding that the scientists came to about 10 years ago at the same time that I was getting really frustrated that the science message was not getting out, the scientists were getting really frustrated at their inability to communicate that. And so we had some uh, converging groups come together. You had on one hand, the scientists who wanted to be better communicators, and then you had communicators like myself who wanted to understand the scientists better. And we started talking to each other and in the last decade, what you have is a, a much larger group of uh, journalists, writers, and, and producers who, who get the science and are really trying to push it out there. But you've also got a cadre of scientists who are really starting to be first class communicators as well. Uh, uh, Michael Mann is, is a primary example. Uh, right. who's really done uh, a lot of amazing work. My colleague, uh, Dr. Jason Box, uh, uh, is part of the Dark Snow Project, which is a, an international 
climate communication uh, endeavor, uh, crowdfunded, and it's kind of like ever shifting, ever morphing uh, in, 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 in what we're doing, but the, the common theme is that we work uh, in and around Greenland, we follow scientists, we, uh, we try to tell the stories that they are uh, digging up in their research, and, um, and we'll be going back uh, this time, uh, this year for the sixth time, fingers crossed, still fundraising for that. Um, and so that's been, uh, that's been a major uh, uh, kind of step up in, in my work is to actually spend time with scientists in the field and uh, that's really elevated my, my understanding of the whole issue. So we're still in trouble, you know. Uh, there are a number of promising developments uh, in the renewable energy space. And you may be hearing my cat sneeze nearby here. But, uh, uh, but we're not, we're doing a lot, but we need to be doing about 10 times as much, 10 times as fast as, as we are doing. But it is critical, I've learned, to uh, outline what the solutions are for people, because if you just lay out a problem that is as daunting as this one, uh, I think psychologists would agree with me that people almost physiologically cannot hear you. They can't hear the message about the problem if you don't show them that there's a, a way forward. Yeah, I, I would take it a, a number of steps further than that, but, but let's wait on that conversation for a little while. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could, could summarize what you see, where you see we're headed. You know, I'm, I'm not at all asking you to predict, you know, a, a day or a year or whatever of what's going to happen when, but I think all of us have the, the tendency to uh, do, there's a highly technical term that I use, uh, make shit up. Yeah. You know, we, we just got to, we've got to figure what we're seeing on the horizon, whether it's about our kids' education or it's about our retirement or about whatever's out ahead of us. We, we put together some kind of a, a, a guesswork, uh, a, a best estimate, and we work mm -hmm. off of that. That's what, how we kind of put our lives together and, and go for it. I'm wondering what you see in terms of the, the larger scale um, pieces of our predicament that you see um, that are coming more... Uh, intensely or more quickly than um than we may have thought and and are we are we looking at what seems to be a, a perpetually conservative ipcc use of 2100 are we looking at something happening substantial into our uh, earth systems before that that seems likely what do you see well, I will say this, uh, when I first started this, my main focus was pushing back on uh, what I call the, the climate denial crocs, which are these little nuggets of disinformation that are crafted in right-wing think tanks in Washington and New York. Um, but and I'm still doing that, but more and more, it's also I, I, it's also part of the mission to push back a little bit on some of the really catastrophic uh, projections and ideations that are out there, especially on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, nobody knows the future. We could get hit by an asteroid tomorrow. Uh, and we'd never even see it coming. Uh, but it's, it's important to realize that we, we, there are impacts. There are impacts already in the pipeline. We're going to have to adapt to them. Um, but 
time and time and time again, what I'm hearing from the scientists who are at the cutting edge is the biggest factor going forward is still the human factor, the, the choices that we make. Right. We are still the biggest driver here. We yeah. have not, you know, we're not, uh, we can't control the impacts that are already in the pipeline, but we have uh, our hands on the major levers here. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. I, I guess what I'm asking is, um, given a business as usual model, where are we headed? Are, will we wait till 2100 to see something that um, is absolutely inarguable and shifts our, our collective motivation, or is it something sooner? Well, there's, there's a certain fraction of the population that's never going to get it. And uh, so don't worry about that. Let them go. Yeah. Uh, the fact is the majority of people do get it right now. Uh, there's, there's a working majority of people that get that climate change is happening, that humans have something to do with it, and we need to do something about it. Um, so uh, uh, what's concerning is that there are some parts of the system where things are moving faster than scientists would have imagined uh, uh, certainly 20 years ago. And uh, one of the biggest ones is sea level rise and the, uh, the impact on ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, so, you know, Greenland is moving much faster than anyone would have guessed in, say, 1995. Uh, and, and Antarctica is uh, beginning to move. And in particular, large parts of Antarctica East Antarctica, which scientists just assumed would be stable for hundreds of years, are also detectively starting to move. And so what's happening with the, the estimates of the sea level rise we're going to see, they have been creeping up and up and up and up over the last 20 years. Right. And so where we were talking about uh, 15 years ago, we were talking about centimeters. Now we're talking about meters. Yes. And uh, and we're looking at, you know, mainstream conservative estimates that with business as usual, if we continue doing what we're doing, then uh, we're looking at sea level rising uh, at at a rate something like, you know, six inches or a foot per decade, you know, by the end of the century, which is unsustainable. I mean, that, un, that it's hard to imagine how we adapt to that as a civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and you, I'm, go I'm ahead. Cur I'm curious if in uh, the elements that you're laying out, it, it does the, um, I think it's called a blue water event, you know, the what looks to be coming fairly soon when we have a, um, an ice free Arctic in the summertime, you know, will it be this year? I don't know, but it doesn't look 10 years off. It looks soon. I'm, I'm curious what you see with regard to that. And is that something that you've heard from some of these scientists we're talking about? It, it seems like a substantial, like a very substantial tipping point. Does it show up for you like that? Well, uh, I think most of the scientists involved in Arctic ice will still tell you that the 2030, 2040 time frame is when they confidently expect that we'll see uh, open water, uh, essentially, in the Arctic through the summer. But the ice is, has been impacted to such a degree, and, and again, this is something unexpected 20 years ago, it's being impacted to such a degree that you could argue that theoretically any given year, if you get the right set of conditions, we could, we could wipe out the ice in the summer. Uh, and, and things are looking, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting what's going on this year. The, the ice is being, we're at some of the lowest levels uh, that we've seen in the record for, for this time of year. 
Uh, some parts of the Arctic were already looking at, uh, they look like September. They look like the lowest uh, level, like right now, except we've still got two or three months to go in the melt season. So right. that will be uh, certainly uh, a watershed event when it happens. Uh, those, those satellite pictures are going to shock a lot of people. And, and that will be probably a, a pretty big moment of acceleration in the process because with all that open water absorbing sunlight, uh, that's, that's just going to be much greater volumes of heat going into the ocean and into the Arctic system. Yep. So, uh, I, I will say that, uh, one of the, one of the sort of cottage industries on the internet is warnings about the huge volumes of methane are going to inevitably burp out of the Arctic, especially un under the, uh, uh, the, the, con the, con the cotton, well, the permafrost, but then the continental shelf, uh, un un under the Arctic ocean. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is a lot of caution on those uh, predictions from people who are pretty knowledgeable, and I'll, and I'll just give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, when we, the most compelling uh, evidence for everything we know about climate change is when we look back at the fossil record, because we assume that the way the Earth has behaved over the last four billion years or so is probably the way it's going to behave for the next hundred. And we, we, we are quite certain that we can look at periods of time that were as warm as what we're going to see in the next 50 to 100 years and, uh, and, and lasted for a fairly long time. Uh, like, for instance, the last interglacial period, much like our own about 120,000, 110,000 years ago. Um, uh, those periods lasted for for several thousand years, and that methane did not come out. It did not come out in the volumes that would some people are saying we will see that would be you know calamitous for civilization. So that's reassuring. Now on on the downside, uh, we're applying a forcing to the uh, to the planet to the atmosphere that is much stronger and over a much more compressed time frame than anything that we saw in the past. You know, those uh, interglacials in the past were brought about by very, very slow, gradual changes in the, the orbital tilt and the shape of the, the Earth's orbit around the sun and uh, things like that. Those are, those are, uh, extremely slow and just just very 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 slight physical processes that you could you know several human lifetimes go by and you would not notice the difference you know you only notice the difference over five thousand ten thousand years but we're applying a forcing that's we're seeing within a, a decadal time frame you know and so <clears throat> So that's unique. And the fact is that we don't really have any models in history that give us a whole lot of uh, guidance on what that means. Right. So, uh, so you know, uh, you know top level uh, uh, take on that is take a breath, you know, don't, don't run for the hills, <laughs> you know. Just yet, but you might walk for the hills. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, and and above all, you know, if you care about your children, you know, work towards push pulling back from this business as usual. Because uh, if we continue to apply this level of forcing, we're going to see certainly some nasty, nasty surprises out there. And there's a few other in the queue too that I should probably talk about. Okay. Can you be sure to flag those? Cause I'd like to just 
uh, pull on a particular thread you just mentioned. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to suggest to people to pull back from the business as usual consumption and emissions and, you know, do our part and stay engaged and, and vote the right way and so on. I, I, I get that. And, and um, certainly I, I have my own version of those things that I do. And so, but I think you and I both know that there are massive pressures, massive forces at work in our culture <clears throat> that um, that really are not interested in slowing down in any way shape or form the business as usual model that is their model that's all they know and that's all they are committed to maintaining and those forces aren't benign in my experience and in my judgment. They're uh, quite forceful by their nature and the forces that they exert uh, can sometimes um, have some really unfortunate uh, targets. And I'm thinking of, of some of the scientists that you may have interviewed over time, heard them speak, heard them share. I'm wondering if you could share either from your experience or anything that these folks have shared with you, what's been the impact of various corporate pressures or governmental pressures to maintain the status quo of, of, uh, of the business as usual fossil fuel driven world on, you know, the, the names that come to mind because they're just so darn obvious, you know, for anybody who's looking at all of these issues, Michael Mann being at the top of the heap, just being vilified by our government and a number of other influences. And I know, well, I recall reading in a couple of articles that Jason Box also made his choice to, uh, you know, go to live in a different country and be sponsored by different uh, governments uh, because of the, the aggression that he was experiencing. Um, can you share anything about that? Well, uh, you know, people like Mike Mann, Kevin Trenberth, Malcolm Hughes, uh, uh, Jonathan Overpeck, um, uh, these folks have been under attack. They continue to be under attack. Uh, they were getting a lot of uh, legal threats. Uh, there is now something called the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, which has uh, uh, stepped in to provide a buffer for uh, some of these folks, and, and it's been really helpful. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, our, our universities have been generally pretty good at uh, shielding scientists from uh, pressure from uh, some of the more uh, aggressive uh, right-wing fossil fuel interests. Uh, so I, I, I think I think the scientists are weathering that storm. Um, it's 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 really not so much the scientists but the science mm -hmm. that is under threat right now, uh, particularly with this current administration. And uh, I, I don't think I can uh, touch on that without mentioning that uh, the the influence that Russia has obviously on this administration, and this is the big uh, crisis politically that we're going through right now. In, in, in essentially, this is a war. You know, we, we uh, the the election of 2016 was a Pearl Harbor event. You know, it's not a war that we've ever seen before. It's a it's a cyber war. It's an information war. Uh, but it's being conducted pretty much out in the open by uh, uh, primarily Russia. Uh, they are the world's largest or one of the world's largest producers of fossil fuels. Uh, it's not a, I don't believe it's coincidence that many of the uh, meetings that uh, the special counsel, Mr. Mueller, is, look, uh, is looking into uh, also involved uh, people from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, other oil states. And um, 
Russia relies uh, on fossil fuels for about 70% of its uh, total revenues. So it's literally, uh, it's kind of a criminal fossil fuel enterprise. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they decided that they are going to take a very active hand in, in uh, seeing that we continue to rely on fossil fuels. And you can see it in the, the activities and the initiatives that the, the Trump administration has been undertaking. And I'll further uh, assert, and I'm not, not by any means am I alone in this, uh, folks may remember that in 2009, uh, not long after Barack Obama's election, there was a, a plan for a big meeting in Copenhagen where it was assumed, it was a COP22 meeting, uh, uh, it was assumed that there would be a major advance in uh, international cooperation to deal with climate change. Uh, about a month before that meeting, uh, a number of, of stolen, hacked emails showed up on a Russian server, and they were all uh, collated and, and ready to go uh, with uh, with uh, uh, certain key quotes pulled out of context that were eagerly seized on by the usual right-wing media suspects mm -hmm. and really went a long way towards damaging public understanding of uh, climate science. Right. Uh, what we saw in the 2016 election is basically the same mode of, of attack you know, uh, and if we and if we look at uh, if this were like CSI, you know, uh, a CSI case, we'd say, you know, what what was is there a motive? Is there a means? Is there an opportunity? Uh, and who does that point to? You know, uh, and I know I because I've talked to senior uh, military people who who agree that Russia is a prime suspect in the, the 2009 climate hack as as they are now with the uh, the recent election. So so fossil fuel politics uh, has been driving a lot of global events as we know. It drives wars, it drives revolutions, it, it drives uh, politics and trade. And this is this the, the politics of, of climate is absolutely central to the the vital interests of the most powerful fossil fuel interests on the planet. So yeah. uh, this is we we are we are in it right now. This is what it looks like. Got it. I am in complete agreement with what you just said. Um, I uh, just a few minutes ago I interrupted you, and you mentioned a couple of other uh, flags, a couple of other things that have got your attention. Perhaps like this possible blue water event at some point soon. Uh, something else that that causes you some concern. Can you say more about those? You bet. Uh, one real wild card that's kind of uh, come to the fore in the last six months, although I've been tracking it for a while. Uh, m most of us probably remember, maybe we went to see the movie The Day After Tomorrow uh, in 2005, uh, which is a fun movie. And, uh, uh, but uh, was this over the top sci-fi uh, fantasy and, uh, and should be regarded as such, but it did have sort of this little grain of fact in it in that there is something called the Atlantic Mary O'Donnell overturning circulation. Some of us think of it as the Gulf Stream, but basically, warm tropical water is moving up the Atlantic. It goes up towards Europe and it accounts for a large 
uh, in large degree for uh, a much milder climate in places like uh, the UK and Scotland and Scandinavia than they would otherwise have because those are very northerly uh, 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 latitudes. And uh, there has been concern that uh, this was a great concern about 20 years ago, and a lot of people were talking about it as, as more uh, ice melted in places like Greenland, there was more fresh water coming out into the North Atlantic, and there was a possibility that that change in salinity and temperature might slow or stop the circulation, and that that warm water would stop reaching uh, Northern Europe. And so that's the, that's the grain for the movie The Day After Tomorrow. And in the movie, the, the flow shuts down suddenly, precipitously, and the, the consequences that they imagine are, you know, completely off the chart fantasies. But, uh, but the phenomenon is real, and the IPCC looked at it uh, in uh, several of their reports, and by you know, 20 by 2007 and by 2013, when we had the most recent reports, they were kind of downplaying the, the probability of such an event happening anytime soon. And however, we now have some pretty good data uh, of the flow of that North Atlantic current and it does appear to be show, to, to showing that it's slowing down uh, in a way that's pretty unusual over the last thousand years or so. And uh, it's, it's a much more lively topic of conversation among scientists. I'll give you an example. Um, I was in, when I was in Greenland last year, I spoke to uh, one of the really senior ice core experts, someone who really knows the, the geologic record of Greenland and Antarctica very well, J.P. Stephenson, uh, he's a Danish uh, scientist and, and leads one of the ice core drilling, uh, one of the key ice core drilling projects there up in, in Greenland. And he his conversation to me was that he was not as concerned about sea level rise as he was concerned about a possible slowdown or shutdown of the North Atlantic current, because we have seen it happen in the fossil record. We know it can happen. And we know that it's been stable for the last 10,000 years. But Prior to that, during the Ice Age and during the times when the planet was changing states, as it were, that current was very, very volatile, volatile and it would, it would change in the course of just a year or two, mm. and then remain in, in a changed state for a, a thousand years or more. Uh, and it would be going on, off, on, off, on, off. Uh, in, in really wildly unpredictable ways. And uh, his concern is that we've gotten really used to the last 10,000 years of what we call normal, mm -hmm. but that we're pushing this system really hard. And, uh, and we know from the record that it's capable of shifting really quickly. So it's... Uh, it's a little like the ice sheets in that regard because we know they can move fast, we know they can change really fast, but we don't really have an example in the fossil record of the kind of changes, the kind of forcing that we're applying right now. So we, it's hard for us to tell, could you know, a, a, a really uh, uh, huge, huge change be a year away or 200 years away there's no we don't have a good sense of of how that might play out and that's so that's an example of, of something that's uh, really kind of a wild card out there that could that could change the whole dialogue really quickly yeah uh you know 
within within our lifetime. Are there other factors that have your attention in in, in addition to those two? Well, I think uh, we're finding out more and more about the relationship of of uh, uh, climate to to extreme weather events. So, if you take uh, uh, a storm like Hurricane Harvey, you know. Uh, which hit Houston, and you may remember Houston got something like 60 inches of rain uh, last year. And uh, the, the key thing to understand about extreme weather events like that is that uh, it's, it's, it's not just about how extreme the weather event is, it is about the, the um, resilience of the human systems that we have built, the infrastructure that we have. So the example that one scientist made to me is the, the levee, if, if the water rises in New Orleans to, and it's still six inches below the levee, then everybody's happy. But if it's two inches above the levee, then game changer, then we're all not happy. And, and billions and billions and billions of dollars in damages. Same way with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, had Hurricane Sandy, the exact same storm, hit uh, Manhattan 60, 80 years ago, the damages would have been uh, much, much, much milder because the, it, it came in riding on an extra eight inches or so of sea level. And just those extra few inches was enough to bring it into uh, southern Manhattan, lower Manhattan, and flood the subways and basically wipe out an enormous amount of very, very expensive infrastructure. So, so the, uh, uh, the tipping point is not just in, you know, what the climate decides to do. The tipping point is also when these gradual, gradual changes suddenly reach a point where they're uh, overcoming the resilience of, of human structures that were built for really a different planet a hundred years ago. Right. So, uh, so the, the potential exists uh, for hugely expensive catastrophes uh, in, in a relative near future, because all, all we've got to see is one of these uh, really powerful storms spin up and you know we were very fortunately we were very fortunate that uh, Miami got missed by uh, I believe it was Irma that came up through Florida uh, initially for a few minutes there it looked like it was going to do a direct hit on Miami and that would have been uh, that would have been uh, probably a, a sentinel event had that happened. Uh, it was still pretty bad, but it was nearly as bad as it could have been. Right. And so uh, we're, we're looking at a warmer ocean. Uh, these storms, uh, we have new research that shows that the number of these category three, four, and five storms is increasing. In fact, uh, scientists are, some scientists are calling for a category six because we're starting to see storms that are so much more powerful and destructive. Uh, you add an extra 10 or 20 miles per hour onto the wind speed of, of those uh, uh, heavy storms, and, and the amount of destructive power goes up geometrically. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, we're looking at, at uh, storms. I believe uh, Kerry Emanuel, who's the hurricane expert at MIT and probably one of the most widely quoted uh, hurricane experts on the planet uh, mentioned to me that something like half of all the all the hurricane damage that has happened in the United States adjusted for inflation since 1850 has been caused by something like six or seven storms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's those big, big storms that really just cause incredible uh, havoc. And, uh, uh, you know, and really hit everybody's pocketbook because 
uh, we're all on the hook if if uh, New Orleans New Orleans gets hit again for another 70 80 billion dollars worth of damage uh, the, the the potential damage in a place like Miami is just incalculable yeah well and um, no small irony that you and I are talking on what appears to be the uh, inarguable threshold of a new era of stronger storms and stronger weather event, you know, weird weather events around the world, including obviously floods, but also I would say wildfires as well. Uh, and so we, you know, I, I am not an actuarial, but um, I have, but I have played one on TV, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I actually have worked with uh, some pretty major insurance folks over the years, and um, it's stunning to me that they are as behind in their calculations and projections as they appear to be. Um, it, it looks to me like uh, coastal cities around the world, but obviously particularly in the USA, are going to be uninsurable. Just period. Just that there, there will not be insurance available, uh, except at such extraordinary rates that it will be uninsurable. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm just saying no surprise there. No, it's it's starting to happen uh, in places like Miami. Uh, we're starting to see impacts on uh, insurance rates and also on uh, real estate prices. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is, uh, I think some people are starting to refer to this as climate gentrification. So there are some parts of Miami that are, you know, a little bit further inland that have been less desirable real estate and maybe, you know, people of more modest income live there, but now suddenly they're becoming uh, more desirable for the wealthy people who still want to live in Miami but don't want to live in the most vulnerable areas. And so uh, we're actually starting to see real estate impacts from that. And we're also seeing people that have, uh, that have the means are, are building uh, uh, structures that are elevated, with, that hardened to, to survive stronger storms, uh, and things like that but of course that's not within the means of uh, most people so it puts in more and more pressure on you know the the teacher or the postal worker that saved all their life to buy a little slice of heaven down in florida and they're maybe a mile off the off the coast but they're still within range of just getting clobbered yeah. by one of these storms and eventually the federally backed flood insurance is not going to cover those people we're, we're just going to have to pull the plug on it because we won't be able to afford it yeah and it may take one storm two storms it may take five storms but eventually we're going to say you people just have to back off clear out and yeah. you're just going to have to take a loss yeah and uh, it's it's happy it happened in houston after uh uh, this after Harvey, a whole lot of people did not have flood insurance and uh, had to basically sell their houses at a loss and just leave. Yep. Uh, and so this, we're going to see more and more of this. Yep. I'm, I'm with you. I, in fact, a, a, a few years of my, career, my varied career were, was in a uh, working in the building and planning department of a of the county that I live in, and uh, part of that was to get myself trained as a floodplain manager, uh, which is a, a uh, kind of an oddly named designation that's trained by FEMA, so that we can interface with people in exactly that program, the flood insurance subsidization program, and so on. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine, first off, I, I can't imagine how it's been allowed to continue so long because it's just been subsidizing people in in awful situations that will happen again. And so now I guess, as you were describing it, we're, we're coming up on the threshold when, when we can finally let that program go. And I, I would say good riddance, but that's just 
<laughs> one reporter's opinion. Um, I'm wondering if you'd mind a, a kind of radical uh, change of gears here to, you know, I, I don't want to take too much of your time today. And I, I just have a kind of an odd direction I'd like to go for a few minutes. Um, one of my more recent uh, posts in in my podcast, The Poetry of Predicament, which is a, a YouTube channel, is a um, is one that uh, I'm, I'm not usually so, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of using profanity anywhere in my work, but um, this particular one is a, it's a one branch of our communication with people and it's a little bit more off the cuff and a, and a little bit rougher around the edges so we called it um gaslighting and mind fucking and it's episode one of that and uh the star of the show is um i i pulled a number of clips from rex tillerson over the years uh ranging from when he was um asked an extraordinarily uh pro just Per, the perfect question by someone in an audience and when he was speaking in front of the Council for Foreign Relations. And <clears throat> um, it, was, it was one of the smoothest um, pieces of gaslighting and deflection that I've ever seen. You know, it's just was fabulous <clears throat> and horrible. And, uh, and the clips extend to uh, a recent uh, commencement at Virginia Military uh, Institute. Uh, yeah, VMI. VMI. Virginia, Vir Virginia Military Institute. Institute, yeah. And um, I just found that also, the, the irony was so deep and so thick, but even, you know, I've got some pretty astute uh, audience members. And, you know, I, I never want to underestimate their ability to, to see what's going on um, behind a thin veneer. Um, but I would assert that what I ended up uncovering, hopefully fairly well, in that clip, in that whole session, that episode, was that um, we are being gaslighted at a, at a level that is hard to overstate. Like, I, I can't find hyperbole here. <laughs> um, you know, because literally the survival of of many, many species and quite possibly our own are at stake and and our our massive and permanent changing of our shared habitat is at stake. And um the just the irony, layer by layer of what he's saying and and you know, to kind of jump ahead through the the pieces of that those those clips um i know that he, that tillerson was trying to uh make a statement about his um uh, tenure with the trump administration being the uh, secretary of state and and his obvious judgments about trump and his lack of integrity and on and on he said all that by way of being quite diplomatic but still pretty clear and i found it so ironic that behind that layer of irony was the fact that his entire world his entire message at every level is based on the continuity of this killer system this killer system that at best we have uh, less than, there are some that say that our, our carbon budget, it, it's certainly, um, we don't have anything more than 2040. And there are those that say it's, it's quite a bit before that, that we have to be at zero. You know, we, that we will have spent all that we can spend in terms of CO2 emissions. <laughs> And that, that shows up nowhere on his screen. So again, multiple layers of irony, multiple layers of gaslighting. Um, and, and I'm gonna just jump ahead with one of the things that I consider, you know, if that is so in your experience, if, if you can just kind of go with me on that assertion. Um, 
that really what he, what it has cost us to uh, endure and to allow to be compliant with the whole notion that we can selectively shut down science in this particular area and say it is all up for question, it is all doubtful, you know, everything that Naomi Oreskes laid out so beautifully. Um, and we call it real. We call it a real conversation, that it's a thing to take a selective chunk of um, the best science we've ever generated and to cast doubt on it at such a level that we are literally calling to question whether we want to continue to live on this planet or not. So I'm using pretty, I'm in, intentionally using some pretty strong language here. I'm wondering if you have anything that sparks when I say these things. Um, particularly, you know, I, you've oriented me earlier in the conversation. Yeah, we don't want to go too far that way, or we got to watch out for this extreme over here. So I'm wondering if you have any reaction like that for this whole notion of denial as gaslighting and the business as usual structures as gaslighting and shredding our ability to trust at any level in our culture now as a result. Well, I think it's this kind of the, uh, maybe the unforeseen uh, uh, effects of this program of casting doubt on science that started 30, 40 years ago mm -hmm. uh, with these uh, uh, right wing think tanks were initially, uh, they started out with just a, fall, a, a small uh, portfolio of particular topics that they were, they were harping on. You know, tobacco was a big one. Uh, and then they started branching out into climate science and, and a few other areas. Uh, and, and, and the whole thrust has been to, to degrade and undermine people's trust for our most, uh, our most knowledgeable experts, you know, and, and scientists are always right, but they've taken us to Mars, you know, I mean, <laughs> they're right a lot. And, and we, we, uh, we ignore them at our peril. And what's happened is there's just been a, uh, a loss of confidence across the board in, in the whole idea of, of knowledge and expertise. In other words, I can do my own research on Facebook and, and feel that I can completely ignore the conclusions that our, our highest level scientific uh, minds have come to in, re in reviewing and learning from 200 years of research. You know, it's, it's absurd. And yet that's where we are. And, and because we have a significant population of people across the spectrum who have been uh, moved to that place, those folks can be very, very easily manipulated. And um, uh, it, it, there's a very significant question whether, whether our democracy can survive this. You know, we have to get back to a, uh, you know, the, the mainstream science isn't always right, but they're right a lot. And we need to kind of maintain that touchstone. The mainstream press is not always right, but there is information there that we cannot ignore. And we ignore at our peril, especially if we start branching off into some of the, the more uh, less fully vetted corners of the internet. Uh, we, we can lead ourselves astray in very, very short order. And uh, democracy re relies on a, an educated citizenry. And uh, so I, this is one of my greatest concerns and one of my greatest disappointments, you know, that we're having to, that we're so far behind in getting people to understand science and to, at, at a minimum, trust 
uh, scientific authorities who have who have spent their whole lives trying to understand. Yeah. Uh, Peter, do you have any suggestions, a uh, small handful of websites or books that you could suggest to folks to get their toe into the water of understanding the basics of what's going on with climate change and other major factors? Well, let me, let me push my own video series, uh, Yale Climate Connections. Uh, I have been doing a video series called This Is Not Cool for Yale Climate Connections for the last seven years. And there's a whole playlist and a library there of many, many topics. And you will see, uh, you won't see me, you will see experts who are at the very top of their field explaining as best they can everything right up to the minute as they understand it. And uh, so that's a great place there. Most of them are seven or eight minutes or shorter. So they're relatively easy to digest. Uh, skepticalscience.com is a really great website for uh, that breaks it down into sort of what's the myth about climate and here's what the facts are and you can you can read that at a beginner level or you can take it to a very advanced level it's set up really really well to uh, help people through understanding uh, uh, Another more advanced website is called Real Climate. Uh, I don't know if it's a .org or .com, Real Climate. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's run by actual scientists. These are the scientists we talked about who are trying to be better communicators and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, so those are a few that, that come right to my mind. There's, there's a few books out there, uh, I'm not, a big book reader because I'm constantly reading, uh, you know, actual research and stuff as it comes across online. Um, but uh, Naomi Rusky's book, uh, uh, The Merchants, Merchant, of Merchants of Doubt, mm -hmm. is not a bad uh, primer yeah. for where we are and why we are. And Michael Mann's. A hockey stick in the climate wars would take you right into the front lines of that's an excellent that others book. have had to endure so yeah 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 those are all excellent excellent sources great summer reading not great reading if you are easily disturbed and kept up at night but uh important reading certainly yeah so as as we're wrapping up here um peter i sure do appreciate your time and and uh I'd just like to ask a, a more personal question, and uh, I guess I'll lead by by kind of showing you my hand. I, um, I, in writing my own first book and putting it out last year, it's called The Impossible Conversation. I um, I vetted to the best of my ability the the, the abrupt climate change information that uh, I had been woke with. Um, but I had to get out of that that study as quickly as I could because of the toxicity of the d denial conversation. It's just, you know, the word that comes to mind for me is evil. But that's that's a whole nother discussion for another day. Where I went from there was to look at what other impacts is the human operating system having on the planet. And I started to look, well, I started where my heart is and where I go to, I've always gone to recharge my inner batteries and that is the ocean. I've just been an ocean guy all my life. And um, I started to look at, so what are the impacts? What are the metrics? What are the projections for the ocean? And it, and it literally broke my heart. And I've been staying really close with that information ever since. And it is no more encouraging now than it was then. And so I use that not so much, not at all, to depress myself. I use that to keep my heart open. I keep intentionally breaking my heart open to keep feeling in an appropriate way and in what Carolyn and I might call a safe container, meaning friends who can come together, support one another, help each other feel, rather than kind of override and, and kind of paste over the uncomfortable feelings like grief and so on. Um, and, and that's what keeps me going. 
you know, keeping my heart open that way is hard as heck to do, but uh, it is life giving. So all of that aside as an example, is there any aspect of this world and what's going on that continuously nudges on your heart that really makes, um, makes an impact on you like you care about it and it keeps nudging on you? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I live in, in the Midwest, I live in Michigan and, uh, you know, my Grand Canyon, my Yosemite is like the Great Lakes, you know, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron. Uh, these are places where I grew up where uh, that are absolute touchstones for me. And uh, I'm, I'm continuously and deeply concerned about the impacts that we're seeing uh, on these systems. And I'm deeply concerned because I have uh, two children who are grown now, but uh, they're smart enough to see what's going on. And I, I have to, we have had some serious conversations about what's going on and what it means for their future. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they're thinking about starting families and, and how does that impact them? Um, it's, uh, these are, these are the things that kind of keep me awake at night. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, you know, ask myself, am I doing enough? You know, what, what could I have done? Uh, I don't know, but it, it gets me out of bed in the morning and uh, uh, actively continuing to work to just make sure that, that we understand this uh, as best we can. And that the information that, that I have gets out to as wide an audience as possible. Got it. Thank you. If if we could imagine for a moment that this is a far larger um, media portal, if this were CNN or you know if we had a few million people online and and uh, watching this interview, and you had a couple of minutes of that open mic to just offer something from your heart to theirs something that really says what there is to be said from your perspective to, to folks out in the world. What would you like to say? We've got a problem. Uh, it's it's uh, as great a challenge as human beings have ever faced. Every generation has uh, a, a challenge. You know, there was, there had been World War II, World War I, there have been you know, a civil war, there's been the Black Plague, you know, uh, every generation has a challenge. Um, this one is maybe the most significant one that we've seen in human history, but we have the tools uh, to, to address it. We can't completely avoid it. We, we're gonna, we're gonna see impacts and we're gonna see impacts that are that are tragic and and will will challenge us, you know. And and grief is going to be a legitimate response to a lot of what's coming. But uh, I I think that the the technology is there, and that and the changes that we're seeing are so rapid that uh, it's worth pursuing, it's worth pushing, it's worth going forward because uh, I, I think, I still think that we can, uh, we can make things better or at least much better than they would have been. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that I would encourage everybody, if, if you're concerned about this, don't, don't hold back. You know, we need to hear your voice. You need to tell somebody. Right. Well, Peter Sinclair, thank you so much for your time. And even more importantly, thank you for your work for years now to get this, these important messages out, to um, make so much more accessible the important work of scientists from around the world. And, and I agree with you at a time when uh, 
the stakes are huge. So um, I want, want you to know I, I just appreciate the quality down to really the production values of what you do. Doing a great job. Thanks. And I want you to know uh, if you ever need a grip on uh, any of your trips to Greenland, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And again, really thank you for your work. And um, I hope this is not our last chance to, to talk. It's been a real pleasure. I've learned a lot. And um, just, a, again, appreciate you. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And uh, don't hesitate to call on me. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, The New Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, The Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.